Hi everybody, it's Richard here again with another video and today I have a very special guest, none other than Mr. Rob Walker. How are you keeping, Rob? Hi Richard, yeah, I'm good, very good. Reckless, reckless store day today, so I know exactly. you've been busy. <laughs> I have, I've non-stop all day. Uh, today what we're going to be looking at is a bit of a discussion about a band that splits opinion and it's the Style Council. It's the band that Paul Weller uh, started after he broke up the jam at the end of 1982. Now, I don't know about you, Rob, but I was devastated whenever I found out the jam had broken up at the end of 82. And I think that one of the last gigs was actually the one that was televised by the Tube. Do you remember that one? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I remember that on the Tube because um, we had a VHS, so... I was able to record it so and they put on, it, they were absolutely brilliant. I think it, it was the, the first edition of the tube. It was exactly the very first one. And they yeah, played the so. modern world as well. I couldn't believe that they played that, but it was, it was really, really good. But in hindsight, I think they were right to split up when they did. Because looking back now, now that's 40 years ago, mm. 1982, I don't think was their best year. I think it was probably, apart from 81, when they only had two singles. But the 82 stuff wasn't as good as the previous stuff. Quickly, what do you think about that? <laughs> or am I talking rubbish? Beat Surrender yeah. was crap. Sorry, it was a crap single. Are we, are we going to fall out already? <laughs> so, um, 80, I mean, 82, the jam were, I mean... The biggest band in the UK, I, I would yeah, say. Yeah, I don't. Um, Town Called Malice came out. I can remember it coming out. Um, and it's one of those singles now that gets played mm. on the radio. And it's, it's you know, it's aged well. Yes. Longevity. And um, Precious was on the flip side. And they, it was quite famous at the time. They played Top of the Pops and they, they played That's both awesome. sides, which was exactly. quite unusual. Um, they brought out, um, like, the album The Gift came out, which mm -hmm. I know you're not a massive fan of. I like half of it. Half of it. Uh, there's only one track that I don't like on that album, and that's uh, Planet's Dream Gone Wrong. I can't stand that. But that's, the my rest of the album, that's my favourite song. That's my yeah, favourite song. That's my favourite song. Yeah, it shows how similar we are, doesn't it? So... Uh, you know, this, even the song The Gift, Trans Global Express, Ghosts, Carnation, mm -hmm. Running on the Spot, I think it's really strong. Um, and they reissued, uh, well, they released Five O'Clock Hero. That came out, it's like an imported single. Yeah, that's right. You know, you know, and I think it got it, it certainly got in the top 20. Got uh, top I can remember him releasing The Bitterest Pill, mm -hmm. um, which was pretty different, but, I, you know, I liked it. I like that. Of course, they announced the breakup, and I'd only just seen the jam. I went to see them mm -hmm. uh, at Bingley Hall in Staffordshire on the 1st of October 1982. Not that it, you know, not I'm counting the days, but and that gig was so I went with about 12 friends. We got on a coach from um, Manchester, and we all had parkers on. And uh, when we got in the gig, it was like a football crowd. Yeah. And, the questions supported them and they were sort of booed off, throwing stuff at them. And then when the jam came on, they played Ghost first mm -hmm. and then they played in the crowd. And the crowd, it was like a football crowd. And me and my friends were split up from then on. Mm -hmm. So imagine the swaying and it, it was so hot. Um, but And then the news came that they split. So that at the time I was... Probably the word would be devastated because yeah. they were my band. And, I, and I've never been bothered about a band splitting up since. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether it's just my age, but I kind of knew they were never going to get back to it together again either, which kind of made me sad as well. Whether if the South Council had flopped um, three years down the line, he might have got back together. But from what Paul Weller was saying, he was sort of burning his bridges, really. Mm. So 
you know, and then you move forward, of course, to um, we're only a couple of months when the Style Council exactly. released the first single. So, which is where we're going to start, and the year is 1983. And um, now there was four single releases in '83, no album, although there was um, what they call a mini album that was imported from Holland, which you have there. Great stuff. I've got it here somewhere, but the, the singles were. Yeah. Speak like a child. Money Go Round. Yeah. The EP A Paris, which had Long Hot Summer, and then yeah. the last one was a solid bond in your heart. Now, the first one I thought was fantastic because I don't think Speak Like a Child was too far away from the sound of the jam at the time. And it was such a catchy tune, full of horns. If you flip the the Bitterest Pill single, you got something like Pity Per Alfie. That's yeah. the sort of sound you were getting. And I thought it was magnificent. Reached mm-hmm. number four in the charts. Great video, him on top of a bus. Yeah, uh, open top bus, fantastic with Tracy Young. Always fancy Tracy Young, dancing around him. Brilliant. Your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, um, I can I can remember in the music press there was um, a picture of Paul and his. It's on the back of the sleeve, actually. You know, in this Mac. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, looking very sort of cool. Little bit of a different sort of image. Um, I think. You know, because it's before sort of streaming, whether I heard it on the radio, uh, but like I say, I can remember reading about it in the music press. Mm-hmm. And it's one of those singles that when I first heard it, it sounded familiar. Yes. It was really instant. Yes, it um, was. And it's, um, I think the Style Council singles are very strong anyway. Yes, but well, um, speak, speak Like a Child is a fantastic single. I think I had it as my number two favourite single from 1983. And I like the flip side as well, Party Chambers. So, I wasn't as keen on that one. I thought it was a bit, bit jazzy. It wasn't quite <laughs> right. It wasn't quite right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that, that was giving you a, an inkling of what was going to come. So Yes, I know. <laughs> the second single, however, which hit number 11, was Money Go Round. Now... <laughs> I bought this and I bought the 12 inch as well. And I used to say to my friends, this was brilliant, but I couldn't stand it. I thought it was awful. It wasn't even, it took from the precious from the jam. It was that sort of funky type tune, not my type of music. Although I really do like it now, especially the 12 inch version. But the only saving grace for this single was Head Start for Happiness, which is on the B side of your 12 inch. Um, but I had to buy it because it was Weller. Weller is God, so I had to buy yeah. it. But yeah. really, I didn't like it. But I do yeah. now. Yeah, it's funny with um, Head Start for Happiness, isn't it? Because it was uh, a single that the, it was a record that the Style Council, when they were doing their early promotion, mm-hmm. they would play that track. Yeah. And I, I can remember thinking, what a great song. Yeah. Um, and it could have really been the A side. I um, think, so. but I think Paul Weller wanted to. Um, I mean, they released four singles in '83, mm-hmm. and they're all totally different. Every one of them is different. That's the beauty yeah. of them. All. Yeah. So I think he wanted to sort of um, just go off on a tangent a little bit. I think at Polydor they said, "Yeah, we like it, but it won't be a top ten hit." And I, I think they were right. Was it number 11 or something like 11, that? Yeah, 11. Um, but I, I liked it because I liked the the lyrics. It was mm-hmm. very, it was pretty political, wasn't it? Yes. And I went down, I went down to London on a, a CND uh, rally. Um, and in, in Brixton, there was a style council. It was like one of the first gigs. So mm-hmm. that was the reason I was going, really. But it was a good demonstration where, um, you know, all the TV cameras were there. You could sort of shout, Maggie, 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 (laughs) out, out, out. What do we want? Education. What do we get? Radiation. So I quite (laughs) like that. So, um, but at the gig, there was, I think, Madness played as well. But Paul Weller was singing and they were throwing mud at him. So, because there was quite a lot of sort of punks there as well. 
uh, and the sound was awful. But it was one of the Stout Council's first. Would it be? I think it was like a benefit gig for CND. So, mm. um, and I, I like the single. And like you say, I like it probably maybe even more now. Yeah. So, but for I me, it was the message. Uh, but yeah, my my problem with the Stout Council is, and it's the same with anybody. I don't like politics and music. I always think that if whether you're left, whether you're right, whether you're in the middle, if you're put politics and music, you are going to alienate one half of your crowd. That's the yeah, way I've yeah. always liked it. It's the same with you before they you before you were very political at the start. Loved them, but just I prefer it without politics. But there you go. Third single, completely different again. And yes, to be honest with you, I don't think I've ever played the fourth track in this, Allude de Par. <laughs> uh, don't bother, you won't like it. <laughs> But two great songs, Long Hot Summer and The Paris Match. And he did The Paris Match on Top of the Pops, which is the yeah. piano ballad. Yeah. Long Hot Summer is, is gorgeous, and it reminds me of the summer of 83, which was a long hot summer. But that video, no. <laughs> it was too camp for Paul Weller. I don't mind camp, but that was too camp for Paul Weller. Yeah, I mean... When that came out, I can remember I was I was, I just started seeing my girlfriend who I saw for about eighteen months. So Style Council were sort of our band, if you like. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can remember speaking to her on the telephone. Remember when you used to phone your girlfriend because mm-hmm. well, the good thing was they weren't texting you all the time, so yeah. you just rung them once a week. Yes. But she lived she lived about fifty miles away, so um, and I can remember speaking to her on the phone. And she said, oh, I've seen the video. So, I said, And I've not even heard the song. I've not heard it. And I said, "What? what's the video? And she said, oh, it's a bit weird. They're touching each other's ears. I said, who is? <laughs> so, it, yeah, it was certainly uh, different, wasn't it? You know, yeah. but <laughs> as, as you say, 1983, I think if you speak to people, I mean, I was 18, coming on 19, um, that song, Totally epitomizes 90, uh, 983, well, it doesn't it? It does, it definitely does. It's got that summer feel to it. There's quite yeah. a few of them, like Bowie's Let's Dance always takes yeah. me back, and Wham's Club Tropicana for some yeah, reason, yeah. you know, 1983. Yeah. But yeah. coming the end of 83, this one came out, and this is my favorite style council. And I did not know that this was demoed with the jam at the time, I only yeah. found that out in. Whenever the Jam Extras CDs came out yeah. in the early 90s, this is fantastic. Yeah. And this was getting more like the Jam. This was the most jammy of the four of them. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, I had a great video as well, didn't it? Oh, brilliant. The two mods going to the, the, the big barn dance. And yeah, nobody yeah. turns up. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah <laughs> Gary Crowley's the DJ. Um yeah, and I, I think it was a toss-up with the jam, with the, the final single. It was yes. either going to be a solid bond in your heart or beat Surrender, and yeah. maybe they made the wrong choice, or whether Paul thought, I'll, I might well, save that one. I think they were right to save it, because what I heard of the demo, in fact, part of Beat Surrender also features in a version of Solid Bond in Your Heart, a little yeah. bit taken out of it, but... Nothing beats that style council version. Nothing mm. beats it. And I'm delighted now, even though I'm not yeah. a keen fan of Beat Surrender, I'm delighted that they stuck with Beat Surrender. Solid Bond in Your Heart, that's... Um, I did, I really did like that single as well, but I, obviously you you did your ranking of mm-hmm. style council singles, didn't you? You beat me to yeah. that. So, well, you, you always <laughs> do. So, yeah, um, I wouldn't have it in my top five. Uh, Style Council singles. I, I might have it in the top ten, but um... <laughs> oh dear, 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 dear! I'll cut this video off now. <laughs> okay, 1983, I think was pretty good. Four decent singles. Yeah. 1984, and we have another four singles, which I'll show first. My ever changing moods. Yeah, you're the best thing. Mm-hmm. Out to the top, 
which I always liked the fact that the 12-inch had a girl on the cover wearing the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something you probably like, but I only bought it because to get the collection up as sold deep. Yeah. I don't have that. I actually quite fancy that. <laughs> and I mean the actual 12 inch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Soul Deep, which was under the Council Collective, which was yeah. for the miners. Yeah. Plus the first album, Cafe Blue. Right. Whenever my ever-changing moods came out, I thought, well, this is it. The Style Council are the best band in the world because I absolutely loved it. I saw it live, first of all. I think it was either on the Tube or on Switch or one of those shows on a Friday night. Yeah, Absolutely yeah. brilliant. And I couldn't wait for Cafe Blue to come out. <laughs> Dear. Um, I was... Oh, I was got it. <laughs> First of all, what yeah. do you think of the single, My Ever-Changing Moods? Yeah, it's probably my favourite Style Council single. Oh, it is brilliant. The horns of it are fantastic. Yeah. And, and uh, I think it was their only um, limited success in America. I that, think it was time. indeed, yeah. Um, but uh, I like the video as well, they're on the bikes. Uh, that's all right. that well. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit oh. corny. But it's well, a... that, that made me, because um, I used to buy... Uh, cycling uh, ah, right. because Paul had it so I had to get it as well <laughs> I wasn't that bad but looking, <laughs> through, looking through this album Cafe Bleu and side two, well there's a side one there's a Cafe Bleu side which is basically your jazzy stuff and um, my ever changing moods is the piano version which is awful well yes it is awful it's still awful I, n I never liked Side One of this at all, apart from one track, which is not even listed here. It's yeah. the whole point of No Return. Yeah. He's uh, actually picking away at a, an electric guitar, which I think is really good. Yeah. But mixed blessings sounds like any old Mick Talbot fiddling about with a piano, which they're all the same. My ship came in. It's okay now. Blue Cafe, Jazzy, mm, all right. And Dropping Bombs in the White House, mm, not great either. Side two, I sort of liked a little bit better, but if I'm being honest, the only two songs I really liked off side two at the time were Here's One That Got Away and Head Start For Happiness. The yeah, rest yeah. I could have done without. Yeah. But my views have changed in this now. Because ever since I bought the CD and I hadn't played this for years, I lived with this. I force fed myself with this. And it still was not working, even though I wouldn't admit it. But about 10, 15 years later, I bought the CD and played it, and I really did enjoy it, including Side One, although I don't like the version of My Ever Changing Moods. And I don't like Tracy Thorne's voice either of Everything But The Girl. Now, does she sing My Ever Changing Moods or does she do the Paris Match? I can't remember. Paris Match. She does Paris Match, yeah. I prefer the single version of that. So I was disappointed in yeah. that album. But I do quite like yeah. it now. Um, it's funny because a couple of days ago I put um, something up on YouTube about name your favourite Style Council album. Mm -hmm. um, I think th only 30 people responded something like that. 50% mm -hmm. put this album as a favourite. Yeah. yeah. So I, I have not got a clue what they're <laughs> thinking. Because, you know, as a... As, um, when it came out, I wasn't aware of sort of jazz music anyway. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'd have been I'd have been twenty, so I was a twenty year old who was into. Um, I would have been. The Smiths were just the second yeah. best band in the world, weren't they? The Style yeah, Council were... were the best. The Style yeah. Council are the best band in the world, and the Smiths were the second best band in the world. Because uh, I can't think of any other band who were anywhere near. So, no. um, for me, that's my standpoint on the Style Council in the mm -hmm. 80s. They're the best band in the world. So, and you can put that on the thumbnail. Um, well, this album's a total car crash. Um, I like the lyrics to uh, the gospel, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't, like the, I don't like the mix of it. No. Um, 
the instrumentals, I quite like them, but I don't want to listen to them. So, you know, dropping bombs on the White House, you know, I like the sentiment, but I don't, you know, I never reach for this album. Yeah. You know, it's not an album that I want to listen to. Um, you know, it's funny how they threw Head Start for Happiness in, which was a B side. Yes. So whether they just thought we need to put something decent on here, and they put that on. Um, like you say, here's one that got away. It's probably a track that could have gone on maybe our favorite shop. Yeah. But um, you know, I know there's people wandering around with this under their arm, saying it's some sort of masterpiece. But you know, for me, I'd give it probably three out of ten. Yeah, well, I give it a little bit more because I, I prefer it now than I did then. Yeah. But the second single was um, You're the Best Thing, which was nice, although I thought the chorus was a bit strained. I thought yeah. the verses was nice, the music was nice, but I wasn't all that keen on the chorus of it. See, I don't, I don't like You're the Best Thing either. I've always thought when people get married, the, I think when I got married, I asked for You're the Best Thing, but as it turned out, maybe it was a good choice. But we ended up dancing. <laughs> we were married for 20 years. It was great. But um, you, get, you get less for murder. But um, I like the B-side, uh, Big Boss Groove. You see, I always really like that. I didn't. That's too jazzy a game, yeah. I thought. But, yeah, I mean, it's a, one of those uh, songs, again, that gets played. On Radio 2, isn't it? You're the best thing. Yeah. I would imagine it, it's been quite a successful one for him. But as you say, something about his vocal on it, I never really liked that song. Yeah, it's, it was very big hit. Number five, of, yeah. as was my ever-changing moods. But no, it was never my favourite. I don't mind it, but it's just not my favourite. However, yeah. the next one I thought was a cracker, and I'll shout to the top. <laughs> Yeah, it's very, very repetitive, but it doesn't bother me. I just think it is really, really good. It's got that sort of almost northerny soul type feel to it. Yeah. And um, I mean, seven. This, this has got um, Ghost of Dashu and um, the Piccadilly Trail. So yes. I, I, we haven't spoken that there were some really good B-sides on the Style Council as well, I think. A yeah. little bit like the jam. And I always think that artists who put good B sides have got confidence in exactly. their songwriting. If you know, we get these bands like Duran Duran, they'll just put a remix of the yeah. same song six times because they haven't got anything original to, to say. Whereas Paul Weller, he was cut above because he put songs like the Piccadilly Trail yeah. as a B side. You know, that, that could have easily been on exactly. Cafe Blur. Exactly. And yeah. it should have been really, if it had been written at the time, it should have been, it would have really enhanced that album. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple of B-sides I will be talking about that I really do like as well. Right, I'll let you talk about this one because I can't stand it. Yeah, so um, in 84, we were, um, that was when Band-Aid came out, um, Do They Know It's Christmas? So there was a whole host of um, international stars singing on that single. Um, Mid Joran, Bob Geldof came up with the with the lyrics and the song. Paul Weller actually went in there as well uh, at the time at the at the start of that process. So um, and Band Aid was obviously phenomenal success leading to leading to the, the concert at Wembley in July of uh, 85. But at the same time, Paul Weller didn't think politically they were hammering governments like they should have been. Um, and of course, Paul Weller's um, anti-Margaret Thatcher Conservative Party stance, um, the minor strike was um, in, in our living rooms, every news, news bulletin we were seeing miners being attacked by police um, and we were witnessing sort of the, the government against the trade unions, if you like. So obviously, uh, with my left leanings, I was fully on board with uh, the sentiment of this, uh, this single. Um, it, I don't think it got much airplay. They did perform it on Top of the Pops, 
Um, Jimmy Ruffin was on there, and I think Junior Giskin. There wasn't yeah. like an array of people queuing up to perform yeah. on this, which is a shame. But I still, I still like this yeah. single. So, and like I say, it was about raising money for um, to help miners' families, really. So for me, yeah. his heart was in the right place. Yeah. And even though it wasn't that successful, um, I really applaud him for doing it. Did a lot of the money not have to go to the family of the guy that yeah. uh, jumped the picket and was killed? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Paul Weller, uh, when he found out about that, um, I don't know if people know the story. There was um, somebody who was breaking his picket line, and I think someone threw some concrete off a bridge and went through yes, his windscreen. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, and killed him. So, you know, obviously Paul Weller was appalled by that. And he made sure that some of the money from the single went right. to help his family. You know, that's a, you know, can't possibly, you know, endorse that kind of thing. But, yeah, a good point. Right, 1985. Okay, I'll show you the singles and then the album. Walls Come Tumbling Down, another political one. <laughs> come to Milton Keynes which is never going to be a huge hit. Yeah, that's a fantastic... I have that 12-inch as well. Come to Milton Keynes, never going to be a huge hit with the name Come to Milton Keynes. That's completely different to the single, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Completely different colour, cover. And then the Lodgers, and then they were all featured on probably most people's favourite Style Council album, but not mine, I'm afraid. And it's our favourite shop. Look at that hair. Is he trying to be Phil Oakey or what? From 1981. <laughs> I think he looks a bit better than Phil Oakey. Okay. <laughs> um, first of all, we'll talk briefly about this one here. And um, it's Walls Come Tumbling Down. This is a rip-roaring song. This is one of his best ever singles. Again, it's political, but this time I don't mind it because the song is that good. And DC Lee's Vocals and this are great as well. It's just fun to play this one loud, really. Play this one loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it got extra sort of coverage as well when the Berlin Wall came down. Yes, yes, so, that's right. You know, um, but yeah, um, in my top five style council singles, again, quite sort of you know, you can imagine the jam sort of uh. Yes. Rocking out the walls come tumbling down. Yeah, I think that's why I liked it because it sort of harked back a little bit to the jam. Yeah, definitely. Um, this one here, Come to Milton Keynes. I like this, but the song title itself it means it's not going to be it. And yeah. there's a really good B side in this when you call me as well. Yeah. Which I think was a single for Tracy Young. Yeah. Years later. Um, yeah. Catchy, but no. Only got to number 23. It's, I, I like Come to Milton Keynes, but it's, when you listen to the album, there's probably three or four songs that should have been singles. Yeah. A couple of real standout singles on there. Uh, a Man of Great Promise is the standout of the whole album for me. This album here, it is their number one album, and I know Ross Goodall really rates this very, very highly. Overall, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, I think it's a great album. Um, as we as we said, um, the track "A Man of Great Promise" um, should have been a single. Yeah, I agree. I think, yeah. I think "Looks" a great song. Yes. Um, as you say, "The Boy You Cry Wolf" is a is a good song as well. I think that I think would have done well. I think it's boring. Um, Sorry, but I do. I don't like it. Um, yeah, well, that's you. Um, <laughs> uh, all, all gone away. I like, um, I like the first track. Um, home is it Home Breakers? Breakers, yeah, yeah, the sentiment behind that song. Um, Everything to Lose. I love yeah. that song as well. I like everything on this album. Um, even the um, stand up comedian, uh, oh, Henry. No. Yeah, because again, it's the it's if you listen to that now, the mm -hmm. message in mm -hmm. that song, okay, probably wouldn't have put it on the album, 
But yeah. the, the message in, in the song is you can't argue with. So mm-hmm. it's a ten it's a ten out of ten easy, this album. It's not even not even I, a question. I think it's okay. I'm not a huge fan. I actually do prefer Cafe Blue to it. Um, it is extremely, it's their most political album, which I yeah. find off-putting. With Everything to Lose is a really good song, but I preferred what it used to be before it became whatever, With Everything to Lose, which we'll talk about in the next year. But yeah. one of my favourite songs of that whole period didn't even get on the album, and it's the B-side of this, Blood Sports, yeah. the acoustic song. I absolutely yeah. love it. Love it the bits. Yeah. I also find that with our favorite shop, Paul Weller is really trying to sing. <laughs> His voice is he's really putting an effort in to get the notes and all, and which I admire and I do think it is pretty good, but he does sound a little bit weak with the voice. Uh, I totally disagree. I oh, think yeah. that um, as I say, if I give an album there's not many albums I give 10 out of 10 yeah. and I give 10 out of 10 to that album. So yeah. there's, there's an, there's an, you know, okay. There's a few tracks that are weaker than others, but in my life, when I was 21, that album, especially when it came out after Cafe Blur, was such a relief as well. Mm-hmm. You know, I was, you know, you're fearing the worst, aren't you? Yeah. Um, but when that came out, I was, I was more relieved but yeah. it's an album that I just, I just love it. I, I'm the opposite. I that, that one, I actually preferred Cafe Blue. It was that one that more or less nearly put me off a of style council. Really? I just couldn't get into it at all. I knew it was good. Everyone said <laughs> it was good. I loved the two singles. But internationalists, I couldn't stand that. And whenever he played <laughs> that live for live, I'm going, what the heck are you doing? Yeah. But um, no, it was never my favourite. It's okay, and I appreciate it a lot more now. I've never actually had that. I had a tape from 1985 on VHS. Yeah, um, yeah but... this, is, this has got all your favourites on it. So Bob Dylan, David Bowie, Neil yeah. Young, they're yeah. all on it. I know, I know. And every, every performance sounds dated. If you listen to that David Bowie concert, oh. it is so... Dated the, the arrangements. I mean, it's got the cars on here, so you know we don't play all just, of it. Just what I needed. I know. I impressed an yeah. old girlfriend with that one time because it was one of her favourite songs, and she was yeah, so yeah. amazed that I had it videotaped. <laughs> <laughs> so you give it a ten out of ten. Um, I'm not so keen on it. I would put it as my third favourite Slide Council album. I'm afraid. 1986, and very, very quickly, we have Have You Ever Had It Blue, which yeah, is yeah. the same song as With Everything to Lose, but it's this is the original version, actually. Yeah. And then I think it was uh, Steve White wrote the lyrics for With Everything to Lose. Am I right yeah. or am I wrong? I don't know about that. But, um, yeah, good song. Enjoy it. It's fun. Yeah. So, yeah. Gets a thumbs I up. It was on the um, Absolute Beginners soundtrack. Yes, I know. Which was a film that I was anticipating. Because um, Patsy... No, it's not crap, Richard. So, um, <laughs> Patsy Kenzie's in it, so it is not crap. Oh, no. And, Granted, th- yes. Yeah. And I, I've had a conversation with Patsy Kenzie, so me, right. me and her go back a long way. So, but, yeah... It's a good, it's a good single that came out at the time, but yeah. it's not one of my favourites. No, well, it's a bit mid-table for me. As we say, um, the Style Council came on after Status Quo and yeah. Live Aid, yeah, which was right. quite a, and you know they put a good performance on. Like you say, <laughs> the choices of song could have been better, couldn't they? I, you know? Without a doubt, especially yeah. they could have done Long Hot. Did they do Long Hot Summer? No, I don't think so. No, I think they just the walls come tumbling down, didn't right. they? And international. Yeah. They did you all the best thing, I think. Yeah. Right. Now, this is 1987. I'll say my bit first, and then you can talk all you like about this. But 1987, we have... It didn't matter. Yeah, we have... Oh, 12-inch and all. Waiting... Yeah. Yeah, I've got the seven. I've got it somewhere. But... 
and the non album song Wanted. Yeah, that's a great song. Yes, it is. It is without a doubt the best song of that year. But the best thing about these two singles is the sleeves, they're cool sleeves. That's it. Yeah, then um, this thing comes out. Excuse me, this album, sorry, comes out. Uh, the cost of loving two 12 inch singles. Take it yours is the same, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, so you bought it on the first week of release as well. Of course I did, yeah. Right, okay, I'll get it over with first. This is an absolute dire mess. End of story. It's boring. The ballads are boring. It didn't matter. It's, ugh, it's okay. It is okay, but he doesn't even sound as if um, he's interested. <laughs> Angel is awful. Waiting is not a bad LP track, but it's not a single. And anyone who says Heavens Above should have been a single should be shot. So that's my The Cost of Loving. Can't stand it. And that's what put me off the Style Council until I bought the other stuff years later. Um, so in, when this album came out in 87, Paul Weller was um, doing a lot with Red Wedge. Yeah. Um, so touring with Red, Red Wedge, with Billy Bragg and Madness and a host of other, uh, mm -hmm. Jimmy Somerville, uh, promoting the Labour Party because there was an election in 87, mm -hmm. which, which didn't go well. Um, so I think historically people are saying that Paul Weller has kind of took his eye off the ball a little bit, but he still came out with his masterpiece. <laughs> Just checking the date. No, it's not the 1st of April. But anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, this masterpiece. So with a homage to the White Album. But I always prefer Orange over White anyway. So right. that, as soon as I saw that, I was, I was all in. It does contain one of the worst, well, certainly the worst Style Council track of all time, which is Right to Go. To go. That is absolutely mess. That's a shambles. Right. Absolute shambles, yeah, that's a total car crash. Um, I like It Didn't Matter, even though Paul Weller does sound totally as though it doesn't matter. He's yeah. not interested. Um, I absolutely love Heavens Above. It's one of my favourite Style Council tracks. Um, the video on Jerusalem, which was um, the Style Council's uh, homage to... Um, what the Beatles film wasn't yes. it? Um, yes, I, I've got the DVD of that. Some not yeah, so Jerusalem is uh, take some. I remember buying that on on a VHS when it came out, and that is really weird. But it does have um, a really good video for Heavens Above, which, as I say, despite what Richard's well, Richard's got a gun out. He's going to shoot me. <laughs> I'm, I'm a I'm a I'm a guy from Manchester. I've come on here as a guest <laughs> of Richard, and he's going to shoot me. So, you know. Um, so there's other tracks on here as well that I like. Um, I love the track, The Cost of Loving. I think it's a great track. Um, Walking the Night, I love that as well. I'm not a massive fan of Angel. I think he's pretty weak. Oh, um, so Fairy Tales has got some input by uh, Curtis Mayfield, so... That's that, not a bad song. I give yeah. give you that. That's not bad. Although, isn't that the one that it's just about to finish, and then they go into a bit of a jam, yeah. and I'm thinking, yeah. don't spoil it. You've just spoiled the song. Stop whenever it was supposed to yeah. stop, and I'll give you five yeah. out of ten for it. But we have to go back to 1987 and remember the music that was coming out in 1987. I think mm -hmm. people were getting excited about things like brothers in arms and things like that mm -hmm. so put this up against the music from 1987 and that's why it's a total masterpiece so yeah the cost of loving by the style council right okay i i've, I've found the doctor now for you <laughs> okay 1988 now i have been pretty harsh on the style council so far but 1988 is actually one of their best years Life at a Top People's Health Farm. Yeah. And the e 1234 EP, How She Threw It All Away. Oh, yeah, lovely. 
And then the album. Yeah. This is their masterpiece. So it is yeah. two sides, one of like piano ballad type stuff, the piano paintings as it's called, and then the pop stuff on the second side. I love this. I think it's beautiful. Side one especially. It's a very deep sea. It's so relaxing. The song, The Story of Someone's Shoe, yeah. it reminds me of Cleo Lane, the way it goes, beep, 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 beep. you know, the way. It's yeah, absolutely yeah. wonderful. Changing the guards, really nice. The Gardener of Eden, the, the, the mini suite is really good, and I love the wee sort of homage to the Beach Boys at beautiful. the end of it. It's a beautiful, beautiful side of music. Very long, though. It's probably best served on a CD. Then you flip over and you get three absolute crackers. The two singles and the beautiful Why I Went Missing. Absolutely gorgeous. And then it goes to spoils it all with I Was a Dual Boys or Dual Dad's Toy Boy, which is pure dung. So it is. But it comes back again with the Confessions 1, 2 and 3, which is fine. And Confessions of a Pop Group is fine. This is their best album for me, without a doubt. And this was the one that only got to number 15 in the charts. All the three other albums got to number two, apart from Our Favourite Shop, which hit the top spot. Yeah. This is the best one for me. Yeah. I bought that album when it came out. So You see, I, I didn't. I yeah. I didn't. I'd given up on them. I bought that for 99p in Woolworths in 1990 or 91. Right. You know, whenever Pullworths were getting rid of all their vinyl albums. Yeah. yeah. So I can remember buying I think I've been on holiday and I came back from a holiday. And um, so this is um, pop, um, the Style Council, um, Sophista Pop, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So Sophista Pop, if anyone who doesn't know, is a term for, I think there's about 15 groups that are, um, come under that category. I don't know if you know any, Richard. I haven't a clue, no. <laughs> so I, well, I'm going to a band who you do not like, who I'd sort of put under that umbrella. Prefab would be, Sprout, I bet you. Prefab oh. Sprout. Probably sort of Swing Out Sister as well. They were around that time who... Yeah. Um, I, I like I, them. I, yeah, I really like Swing Out Sister. So, um, so I bought the album when it came out, but I haven't got a copy of it now. Oh. No, because um, it got uh, divvied up in uh, in the separation. So that album was lost. And a couple of times I've seen it, and I've just not picked it up. And when I went to the record fair today, I asked every vendor if they had it, and nobody had it. No. So, um, but I, I love the first side. It's yep. um, very, very deep sea. Is it the first track? Yes, very deep sea is the very first track. Yeah, that, that's one of Paul Weller's best tracks. It's a great song. Um, I always liked um, the song Confessions of a Pop Group, even though, um, no, um, Life on a Top People's Health Farm. I yes. always like that single. It's a weird one, though. It's a different yeah. sound. Yeah. But I do like it as well. Yeah, it was a bit of a commercial. This is when the Style Council they went from having sort of top ten hits yeah. to getting just about getting in the top thirty, yeah. maybe even below that. So yeah. people's um, people had sort of run out of patience, like you say, because when when the Style Council were formed, um, Paul Weller kind of lost half of his um, fan base oh, straight away because um, I've heard many many people say. The Jam is a favourite band. Mm -hmm. And as soon as the Style Council, they weren't interested whatsoever. I mean, mm -hmm. I think they did pick up maybe more sort of female fans um, in the later 80s with the sound. Mm -hmm. But I, I agree, the Cost of Loving um, uh, Confessions of a Pop Group is a very good album. Probably my second favourite, another masterpiece. So, yeah, the way three masterpieces. Oh, well, we agree on something anyway. <laughs> then, 1989, and we only have a single. <laughs> what do you think of Promise That? It's a cover version of some guy called Joe Smooth who wrote it, yeah. and it was a minor hit from in 87. What do you think? Do you think I would like it, or do you think I will hate it? Yeah, I mean, I remember seeing him performing it on top of the pops. Paul Weller was sitting at a piano, 
Um, I wasn't a massive fan of it, if I'm honest. Um, but that was sort of the template for what was to come uh, and the wranglings that went on with the record company sort of um, at the end of the 80s. So not, I, uh, not a great single. I loved it. It's totally oh, not yeah. my type of music. Right. Not my type of music at all, but I loved it. There was so much energy on it. I really did yeah. like it. And then the, the unthinkable happened with um, the next album. Uh, what was it called? Uh, Modernism, A New Decade. Yeah. Got rejected by Polydor. Yeah. Now, have you heard it? I've heard it, yeah. What are your thoughts? Uh, I can kind of understand why Polydor didn't want to release it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I've, you know, I've heard it a number of times. I don't actually have a copy of it. Um, but I do, I do like it. Um, but it was Paul Weller doing what Paul Weller does. He mm-hmm. he very seldom, he, you know, he, he moves out of his comfort zone very quickly, which can be a little bit frustrating when you're a fan, because there's certain parts of Paul Paul Weller's catalog, the Style Council's catalog, that you really love, and then he kind of goes off on a tangent, and it doesn't always work. But you've got to admire the guy for. Yeah, trying different new things. Well, really, it's a house album, is it? No, yeah, yeah. Techno I, house. I, yeah. I played it. I have it on MP3, and I was playing it last week in preparation for this. And although I don't know whether it's good house music or bad house music, yeah. I don't like house music. Yeah, I preferred it to the Cost of Loving because yeah. I thought it was more focused. Yeah. I think that with the cost of love, I'm not wanting to get back to that again. I just thought it was a mess. This one was actually well focused, but I yeah. do understand as well why Polydor decided to pull the plug because the, the, the success was going down and down and down and down, yeah. and they were, yeah. it was inevitable, really. But um, I think if you, I think if you kind of take yourself back to 1989, so a lot of that sort of house music. I was I was getting into it as well, mm-hmm. um, and then the Manchester scene with the Stone Roses, etc. Um, but as I say, I didn't actually hear it at the time. That's the sort of thing that could do with being released on Record Store Day. I think yes. we got a, a reissue maybe twenty years twenty years ago or something. But I'd love to see that come out on Record Store Day. I would probably buy it if it was Record yeah. Store Day just for the collection. But it's yeah. not the type of music, but I didn't despise it. I quite no. enjoyed it. There's yeah, a song, yeah. Sure is Sure, that everybody goes on about, and I thought that yeah. was the weakest of the lot. But, right. but um, if have you ever seen this compilation? Yeah, I've, I saw you show it. Um, this is brilliant. This is yeah. um, three discs. And the only thing I'll say that's bad about this one is it doesn't have blood sports on it. Yeah. But really, I could, apart from Confessions album, I could give away all the rest of Style Council albums and just keep this, and I'd be happy yeah. enough. Yeah. I mean, they brought out a live album as well, Richard. Have you got this yes, one? Yes, I never got that. Never got it. Yeah. Right, nearly six. Yeah, so, yeah, this is a pretty, pretty solid live album. Did you mm-hmm. ever get to see the Style Council live? Never, never seen the jam live either, unfortunately. Right. Yeah, I saw the Style Council. I was trying to think. I think I've seen them four times. Um, so the, the one of the bands I've seen, the, I've seen Weller about six times as well. Mm-hmm. But I've not seen him for probably about 15 years. But um, live, they were excellent. I um, would have thought so. Yeah. So, yeah, and this is a good... And I, I picked this up recently... I, Showed it this. I think you've got this, haven't you? Have you got, got this one? Well, yeah. Yeah. There are a few remixes in that as well, isn't there? I think my ever changing moods might be a remix. Yeah, it doesn't say on the jacket, but it's. I mean, this is just the singles, but they're not in chronological I order. I know you like that, don't you? I do like that actually. Yes. Yeah. So this is a, a nice compilation, mm-hmm. and I really like the jacket as well. So. I know that is probably their best look whenever he had the blonde hair and they were wearing the white suits. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. From probably their worst period, but still. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so looking back at the style council, 
do you think they were better now or than you thought they were then or vice versa? I don't I don't think my opinions changed. I, I loved the Stout Council in the 80s. Oh. Um, I loved all the singles. I wasn't a fan of Cafe Blur, but all the other albums I really liked. I loved them. Um, and it was a huge part because the jam were around when I was Mm-hmm. a teenager but as I was getting into my 20s and a little bit more disposable income I was able to go and see them live I love the look uh, and also of course the political message as well because mm-hmm. they there was a number of bands around artists in that kind of mid 80s period because there was so much sort of um, it was a very sort of diverse time politically in the yeah. UK mm-hmm. and Paul Weller just ticked the box for me so um, I think I went through a phase probably for about 15 years where I never really listened to them. So mm-hmm. sort of going into the uh, 90s, all the way through the 90s, I was listening to other music. So it's funny, isn't it, how you do that sometimes? Yeah. You know, 15 years, can go, even your favourite artist, like even the jam. I've just yeah. had enough of listening to the jam. Whereas now, if I put a jam track on, it takes me back. Yes. And same with the Style Council. I listen to the Style Council now. It takes me back to those happy days, really. Even though the messages in the songs can be quite pessimistic, overall, it was a pretty joyous time in my life. So um, my feelings on the Style Council are the same. You know, the greatest band in the world ever. (laughs) Well, mine are probably very similar, not to your thoughts, but to what it was back then. I've always said they were a fantastic singles group and really a jam, a jam's greatest hits and a style council's greatest hits. There's not a lot of difference, really. I still prefer the jam, but the style council singles are not far away. Albums, very patchy. One dreadful, two okay, one excellent. Uh, so slightly up with the albums for me because it used to be one dreadful, three okay but now I really appreciate the Confessions album a lot more yeah. so they've slightly improved for me Yeah. Uh, but it's the singles really but it, it's I'm, I'm pleased that you, you came up with the idea to talk about the Style Council yeah. because they're one of those groups that don't really get a lot of attention don't. from they people don't. Um, and I think they just, you know, I don't, I don't know that you can say any band deserves attention but I think if you look at particularly, like you say, the singles, how popular they were uh, in the UK, in particular in Japan. Um, in the 80s, the, for, like I say, for me, I've, I've already said what I think about the Style Council, so mm. we'll leave it at that. But it's been it's been nice to talk about them with you, Richard. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Although we <laughs> didn't agree on everything, but still all done in good fun. Okay, thanks again, Rob. This has been fantastic. Um, that's me for now, and I hope to have another video quite soon. All the best now. Bye-bye. Do you want to say uh, bye-bye? Oh, bye. <laughs> <laughs>